Okay, everybody, this is Francesco Abruzzino, and I am here today with Judy. How do you pronounce your last name, Judy? Bylington? Bylington? Bylington. Uh -huh. Okay, Bylington. She's a MSW, LCSW, a lot of acronyms behind her name, but um, mostly she's known for her book, 22 Faces, where she ex examined the life of um, Jenny Hill, and then um, also her advocacy and um, helping a lot of the children out in some awkward situations out there. She just actually sent me something before I came on here. And I didn't realize how involved you were, Judy, in um, helping a lot of the kids out there and advocating um, for, you know, for on behalf of them. Um, so let's hand it over to Judy. Tell us a little bit of, I'm assuming you want to talk a little bit about 22 Faces that's on and also the um, advocacy of, for the children that you also have through your child abuse recovery page. Yes, I'm a former supervisor of mental health and uh, used to be head of family counseling center. Uh, during that time, I wasn't uh, very aware of a condition that was called disassociation. It used to be known as multiple personality disorder. Okay. Uh, people people would come into my office and they would say things like, "I haven't, I can't remember my childhood. Um, I I can't remember what happened yesterday." Things like that, and I really didn't understand what was going on. When I, I was forced into retirement, I used to be head of family counseling center down in Provo, and and I had a very ill daughter mm -hmm. who um, required a lot of help, and so I was forced into retirement. And during that time, some people that knew that I used to be head of family counseling center <clears throat> uh, came to me and asked me for their help. Uh, they were two women, they were cousins, whose uh, one of their fathers was... Um, the first arrest of the Utah Attorney General Satanic Ritual Abuse Investigators. Okay. And I worked with them for several years, and from that information that I gathered with them, I eventually took it to the FBI, and that's when I met Jenny Hill. Um, and then I wrote her biography, uh, 22 Faces Inside the Extraordinary Life of Jenny Hill and her 22 multiple personalities. Yeah, and I never really heard about the satanic rituals until I came across your name and we started talking and I started looking into it more. Um, it's, it's it's an interesting subject matter there. And, and your interview with Jenny it is, is interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm amazed at, well, I'm amazed at myself for not understanding what was going on when uh, I was in, uh, you know, a formal counselor. Uh, I am more amazed by the amount of um, disinformation that's out about it right now. Um, Why do you think there's so much disinformation in. out there? Well, it's it's really impregnated into our society. Uh, satanic ritual abuse has been going on since you know time began, as far as I'm concerned. It's handed down in what they call multi-generational satanic families. It's very hidden. Uh, generally, uh, fathers will uh, do it to their oldest child, and the rest of the family doesn't even know what's going on. Really? And then uh, some of the children grow up, and they become perpetrators. Uh, uh, others grow up and become survivors, who uh, I have been working with for the last uh, 20 or so years. Uh, it's 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 a complicated factor, and I think one of the reasons is because of this secrecy. What happens is we all disassociate. Like it goes from daydreaming um, on one end of the spectrum to post-traumatic stress. I'm sure you're acquainted with that, uh, which is generally from um, veterans of war who have uh, these horrible memories of, of war that come back after they're in a safe environment. Uh, and then on the far end of the spectrum is uh, multiple personality disorder. Multiple personalities generally just occur to children who are undergoing traumatic uh, situations in their life, and it has something to do with the uh, development of their brain. It's um, To understand this association, you have to understand how your own mind works. Uh, think of your mind as a tree, and the, the trunk of that tree is your core personality. And then if you are a child and you are undergoing uh, some 
traumatic situations that your brain really can't handle, like these children undergo um, torture, they undergo rape, they undergo uh, seeing murders of other children, and those situa situations are so traumatic for them that their mind uh, keeps that memory in a branch of the tree, and it's held by an altered personality. The problem is that that memory isn't connected to the trunk of the tree. You know, there's an electrical circuit that connects the neurons that develop the memory, yes. you know, to your uh, to your core thinking, and that that electrical circuit just isn't there, and it likely doesn't uh, come back until 20, 30, 40 years later when the child has grown up, they're away from their perpetrators, they're in a safe situation, and then the mind will uh, attempt to heal, and that memory will come back. It's called repressed memories. Mm. And, and because of those repressed memories, it makes it very difficult to... Um, for other people to understand, for the legal entities to uh, act on the crimes that have been committed uh, because they don't remember them till 20, 30 years later and victims are, uh, you know, the murders that they've seen, the, the, you know, the evidence is far gone. Well, let me ask you this, because yeah, so, it, it always confuses me or it concerns me. I'm, I sit there trying to wonder how a father could sexually abuse his daughter and the mother never knows about it, and this goes on for years and years and years. To me, I can't imagine that they don't fathom something is wrong with that situation. And then you add in the satanic ritual, which I'm assuming it's got to be somewhat more noticeable there. And I, I find it hard to believe that a mother can't pick up on that. What, what happens there? Where's the breakdown? The breakdown is is the cunningness of the perpetrators. Uh, they have, they're very adept at what they do. Uh, I have talked to uh, several women whose husbands have ritually abused their children and they didn't know about it. Um, and it has to do with this mind control that the, the satanic cults are in, into. It's very, very sophisticated. The child, if you read my book, 22 Faces, and you can go into 22faces.com and read the first three chapters of it uh -huh. uh, for free, uh, and it, it starts Jenny out as a young child, and it shows how a child functions with these multiple personalities. And once you understand that, uh, you can understand how these children, do, what, what happens is they go through these traumatic experiences and then they're held in their minds and the child doesn't know, you know, that they have undergone that trauma. Uh, they just know that there has been a period of their life that they can't remember. Um, for instance, um, in, in Jenny's book, in the very first chapters, she goes past this gray house where her perpetrators are and she can't remember going from you know, one uh, part of the block until she reaches the school schoolyard, and that's because her alter one of her alter personalities has taken over to to protect her mind, you know, from the trauma that happens in that house to her, and that's how the mind works. It's a very protective organism, and it'll protect the child so that the child can survive. Mm. Uh, and, and the mother, and the the women that I have talked to who's children have undergone this and they weren't aware of it, some of them were actually mind control themselves. They, uh, these people, they use drugs for one instance. Uh, there's, there's some drugs out that they use to help their minds not remember some of these events. Uh, they will, uh, they will do all kinds of things, you know, the, um, so the child doesn't remember that they've been abused, and they're growing up in what seems to be a normal situation at home, you know, where everybody's functioning right. Uh, the perpetrator, usually they try to become community leaders, leaders in their churches, uh, leader, you know, nice, wonderful people, but they practice this satanic ritual abuse on the side, and they sometimes they're very influential people in their communities. They're fellow members of the satanic stuff that they're doing, they're very influential and influential and they, they're able to cover this whole thing up. Yeah, see I find that simply amazing and disturbing. Um, 
what happened with Jenny Hill though? I haven't I, I haven't read your book. Um, I did start to read the chapters, but then I got distracted this weekend. Um, but essentially, she went through this. She found out she had the twenty two different personalities. How is she doing today? What happened with her father? Did he, did anything ever become of that? All that good stuff. Or I don't without ruining the book. The end, if it's possible. <laughs> well, a short summary is um, Jenny, when she was age four, uh, her father began raping her. Um, sexual abuse is always involved in this. And, and then by the time she was five, there were some neighbors down the street that were into a satanic worship, and they were teenagers. They started, you know, raping her and torturing See, her. That's disgusting. I don't know how someone could do that to a four or five year old. It it blows my mind. Mm -hmm. it, it is really disgusting, but it's an addiction these people have, and it's addiction to sex and power. That's all it is. Uh, so they started doing this, but they were controlled by a person known as a Dr. Green. Now, Dr. Green was a Nazi uh, mind control programmer that was brought into the U.S. Uh, in 1953 with the rest of the Nazis that were brought in by the CIA. Right. See, around 1953, they formed the CIA, and they brought in all these uh, Nazi specialists, and a lot of them were into the, uh, for the mind control program. Now, how we know Dr. Green was brought in is because in the 19... Let's see, there's 1977 congressional hearings on the program and then 1995 hearings. In the 1995 hearings, there are a couple of uh, ritual abuse survivors that testify. And if you go into our website, childabuserecovery.com, I'm on there now. You'll find, a hist yeah, you'll find a history of the CIA program. In that history, there are links to the uh, videos of these women testifying in those hearings. Both of them talk about Dr. Green uh, being uh, their perpetrator, and one of them was able to get a hold of some documents in his office that showed that he was given, um, I don't know how many million dollars by the CIA to run the program. So that's how, and, and the other reason we know about Dr. Green is that Dr. Corey Don Hammond, who's a psychologist up to the University of Utah Family Practice Center, he did a study back in, uh, in the 1980s on 18 uh, ritual abuse survivors, well, therapists that had ritual abuse survivors as clients. And uh, I think it was 75% of them named Dr. Green as being their perpetrator. Wow. And how we know that that same Dr. Green was uh, Jenny's mind control programmer is they described him, uh, and it's called the Green Bomb speech, and you can find it on the internet. But they describe him in the same way that Jenny describes him, as being uh, short with balding brown hair, had a limp in his left leg, and used a cane, and had a German accent. Okay. Now Jenny didn't. Jenny didn't know, of course, he was being programmed by, by Dr. Green. But she, as she described him to me as we were doing the book, um, I had looked into some of these other things, and then I came across Dr. Croydon Hammond's speech that he gave, and uh, found out that it was the same Dr. Green. So anyway, Jenny was being programmed by this Dr. Green and these teenage boys down the street, and what that meant was that they were raping her, they were torturing her. They were um, forming these multiple personalities. Uh, what happens in the formation of a multiple personality is, is that if a child undergoes torture, then an alter personality will form to hold the memory of that torture to protect the child. And when that happens, is Dr. Green had a system where he would, he would call those alters specific names, specific Latin names, so that as she got older, that anybody that knew that she had undergone that type of programming could call out those specific names and those alters would take over, and in that way they would control that person, you know, like a sexual abuse alter wow. would take over, and then if they wanted to, you know, rape her or do whatever, 
then that sexual alter would be there to do that. So that's a very common part of this mind control programming. So did they ever... So she was under... Did, I'm sorry, did they ever ahead. deduce that the CIA... Um, I'm assuming they sanctioned all of his, um, his treatments and analysis and all of his work, but did they ever realize that he was involved in the satanic rituals? Did that ever come out? It did in these hearings... Um, what's interesting about these two hearings is they held them in 1977 and 1995. And in 1977, the head of the CIA, uh, which was Helms, he actually destroyed all the MK Ultra uh, documents, and then he resigned from office. <laughs> and then the Congress voted not to release the information of the hearings, and so it never went public. Wow. Then. The same thing happened in 1995. There were more, you know, by this time there were more survivors coming out and saying this is happening to me and it's still going on, even though it was supposed to have been closed in 1964, according to the official records of uh, the investigation and that, they closed the program. But you still have survivors that were born after 1964 that are still being mind controlled by the CIA agents. And so we have this hearing in 1995 where some of the survivors speak out. And again, the uh, Congress votes not to release the information, um, and nothing is ever said about it. Another thing they never say anything about is the fact that they were doing this to children, and they were doing it through satanic cults as well as other you know, organizations. Huh. Um, so back there with Jenny, as she as she's undergoing all this mind control and, and torture and everything, but she's not remembering it. And you'll again, you'll understand that more as you read the book. Uh, she uh, eventually she is taken to a satanic ceremony where she sees another child killed, and then she's saved from that ceremony. And I'll let you read the book on how that happens. <laughs> yeah, and it says the <laughs> ending will shock you, so we have to see what that ending is all about. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then she grows up, and, and so the book kind of talks to her, uh, talks about how what it's like to be a multiple personality, as as you're changing personalities, and yet you're living what appears to be a normal life. And so she actually goes to a college and and becomes a uh, nurse, and she uh, goes to apply for a. And there's a lot of other things that happen in between that are really interesting, of course, but she eventually goes to the Utah State uh, Psychiatric Hospital to apply for a nursing job interview, and she changes uh, personalities during her interview, and so they keep her there at the hospital, and that's when all of her memories come back. That's when she's in a safe situation where her mind feels like it's safe for these alters to tell about, you know, what really happened to her. And, and we took that, we took the book from, as a young child, she prayed a lot uh, about what was happening to her because she didn't understand why she was having all these blank periods. And one of the things she was told as a young child was to write down her experiences. Now, as a therapist, I know that writing really helps to heal the mind because what happens is that these memories will you know, come out and the altars will come out. The altars always want to express their frustration and their, that's why a child who is undergoing ritual abuse will say that they have voices in their head. And these are the voices, of course, of the altar personalities and they're trying to communicate with the core personality, but the core personality doesn't want to believe that that's happening. Jenny said that um, if she grew up and she had all these voices in her head, she thought everybody functioned that way. She didn't know that she was any different than anybody else. Hmm. So these all, as she was right as a young child, she would write down, you know, in her diary. And we have some of the copies of her diary entries in the uh, middle of the book where the different altars will come out and they'll write a little bit. And then another one will come out and they'll write a little bit. They're really interesting to look at. Interesting. So we had all these altar writings that we could take the book from. So that's why one of the reasons the book is so detailed is because we were able to take it from not only Jenny's point of view, but from the point of view of her altar personalities as they wrote down some of their experiences. Wow. Uh, now, 
let's go ahead and change it up a little bit and talk a little bit about your re- child um, abuse recovery dot com. Before we get into it, though, I wanted to ask you, I'm seeing a reoccurring theme on there. It seems with your news articles regarding the Catholic Church um, with the Pope. What what kind of connection right. is there? Because right now I see Pope's Vatican, uh, Vatican Satanic. Uh, cult, Ninth Circle Exposed, going to court, Pope Francis protects, we all know about the child abuse, sex abuse victims, but it goes on and on. If, if, what's, mm-hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that connection? Well, that's the Ninth uh, Circle uh, Satanic Cult has just recently, like within the last couple of weeks, come out. Um, I'll have to go back to Kevin Annette in the beginning of the whole situation. Um, Kevin Annette is a... Uh, reverend from Canada who uh, 20 or so years ago was in uh, in a native uh, on a native reservation where he was you know had his church there and he was placed there uh, by his um, church and what he found out was that these these natives weren't coming to church so only white people would come to church and so he got to know the natives really well and found out the reason they weren't going to church was because uh, back in the late 1800s, the Canadian government made a pact with the Catholic Church and the United Church of Canada and the Lutheran Church and uh, a couple of others anyway, to set up residential schools for the uh, Indian children that they would have to go to from age five. The purpose of these residential schools, and there were 80 established across Canada, the purpose was to eliminate the Indian tribes because the Canadian government and the Catholic Church, and they're mainly Catholic, you know, uh, residential schools, they wanted to get control of the native lands, and so they wanted to eliminate the Indian tribes, and they did this by putting these children in these residential schools from age five on up, and then they would give them smallpox, they would rape them, they would torture them, they'd do all kinds of things. Anyway, Kevin Annette, over a period of about 20 years, and a lot of research, and he's got a book out called Hidden No Longer, and he's got a documentary out about it, but they found 50,000 missing children. Wow. Uh, Kevin, uh, along with the Indian tribes, tried to take it into court in Canada and they they were refused that. So he took it over to the UN and eventually established uh, what is known as a common law court in Brussels, Belgium. And they had all this testimony and information that they had gathered over a 20-year period, and they took it to court last year and tried 30 global leaders, uh, one being the Queen of England, one being... um, the Pope, uh, Ratzinger, <laughs> and they uh, they had six international judges, uh, volunteer judges, but there were bona fide judges, uh, uh, 36 jury members, and over a period of about a year, they tried this case and found these 30 global leaders guilty of crimes against humanity. Now, one of those was Pope Ratzinger, who resigned from office the very week that this trial concluded. Really? And and so we believe that it was over all this pressure, you know, of this. Now, since that court <clears throat> happened, uh, there have been more witnesses that have come out about uh, what's happening. And there are, I think, three witnesses that have said that they have seen Pope Ratzinger at satanic ceremonies, uh, I think there's one in France and there's one in Holland. There also you can also see some of that on in childabuserecovery.com. Okay. Um, but they are some of the witnesses that are testifying in the court that actually begins today, a second international court over in Brussels, Belgium today. And when these witnesses came out, then they. Some more witnesses came out uh, over in a in the Mohawk. There was a Mohawk uh, Indian residential school in Brantford, Ontario, where uh, uh, it was. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it was also connected with the Catholic Church and with the with the Queen, and in that. Uh, 
in that residential school, by that residential school, they found a child mass grave site. It's the largest one they found so far. Huh. So Kevin Annette took some archaeologists, and he took uh, a man from uh, a doctor from the Smithsonian Institute. He took another prominent archaeologist and uh, a third uh, forensic specialist. And uh, Kevin Annette himself is an archaeologist. He has a degree. And they uh, they started to do a dig at this Mohawk Indian residential school in Brantford. Uh, they were in on the dig for four days, and they came across some bones of a child that were, you know, verified that this child had been tortured in some way. The Canadian government shut him down from that dig. This was in 2008. Since that dig, they have found, uh, well, officially 28 other mass grave sites at residential schools in Canada. And I think there's one here in the U.S. You just don't hear about um, this stuff on mainstream media at all. You don't. And that's what my articles have been about. Um, the mainstream media has been very reluctant to pick it up, although uh, today I've had some indications that at least one story is starting to be picked up. But uh, there's something in the mainstream media that's preventing these stories from coming out because, they're, of course, there are very big news in Canada in the native papers, in the native, you know, news media, yeah. but not in the mainstream press in Canada. Huh. And so, and so these these um, these digs that went on, uh, they they know that there's there may be 32 mass grave sites, but there's officially 28 identified. One was discovered just a couple of months ago by a bunch of pipe fitters in uh, British Columbia, who. Uh, were doing some work at a residential school, and they came across, you know, child bones. But they will not allow people in there to uh, do digs and officially, you know, recognize these these mass grave sites of children, hmm. which is very interesting. The other part of that was <clears throat> I said that Queen Elizabeth was um, found guilty of crimes against humanity. Her specific crime that. Uh, they they went through the whole trial process on was that back in 1964, she and Prince Phillips were at the Kamloops Residential School in um, I think that's in British Columbia. But they went on a picnic with some children, and then they took ten of those children from that picnic and. Those children's parents have never seen their children since. Wow. That was back in 1964. Now, there were uh, two or three witnesses to that. I think there were three witnesses to that. That were other children at the same picnic. And they grew up. And when uh, Annette had this international court, he was scheduling uh, at least one of those to testify. I think that was the remaining person. Uh, that was still alive to testify at that court, and he died of some very mysterious causes right before court. But Kevin Annette had his testimony on video, and so they used that in the court to convict the Queen of that. So, but records have what happened if she's convicted? Off. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> is it's an international court, and of course. You know, there's not a lot they can do. They do have arrest warrants out that they recently tried to serve on the Queen, and, of course, were prevented from doing that. But what it is doing is it's educating the public uh, as to what is really going on. This night, uh, The other thing I was going to say about this Ninth Circle Satanic Cult is over in Branton at this Mohawk Indian school, uh, there have been witnesses that have come forth that have seen, that have been present at satanic ceremonies where they have killed children that are also going to testify in this court that begins today. Wow. And in that ninth circle satanic cult, they say, are members of the royal family. There are some very prominent political figures um, that participate in these ninth circle satanic cult ceremonies. They feel that there is um, some kind of feeling of power and that they get out of doing this. And so it's very, it's permeated within our society, uh, unfortunately, and it's with a lot of global leaders that, and we know that because of the witnesses 
that were as children were at these ceremonies, and now they're coming out and speaking out uh, about what happened to them. And again, one of the problems in them doing that is that it happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, there's no way to get evidence of that. All you have is the memory of a child who is likely a multiple personality because of the abuse they went through. And that's how they're able to get away with all of this. Wow, that's some interesting stuff there. Really interesting. And um, obviously, you're pretty uh, well educated on all these issues, So, which makes for a great book, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go. Oh, well, one of the documents that they have just recently uncovered, they evidently have some, uh, Kevin Annette, his, his organization, by the way, is called the International uh, uh, Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State, the IPCCS. Okay. But his, and, and they represent a lot of people. They He has organized survivors of uh, abuse in 21 countries. And I went on the internet the other day and came across a website of all this priest, uh, Catholic priest abuse scandal. Yeah. And in that website, uh, they had documented all of the court cases, uh, not not even those that were under presently under investigation, but all of the court cases uh, globally that uh, priests have been accused of of abusing children at. They ca I counted. They have a count in there of over 10,000, wow. 10 million, excuse me, 10 million cases of Catholic priest abuse. Yeah, and you know, that's one of the... So it's a, it's a huge problem. Well, that's one of the driving forces. I was baptized. I actually have a crucifix around my neck right now. That was my father's. And um, mm -hmm. I, I stopped going to church because that whole abuse thing just sickened me. And, um, you know, and then I started reading, I think it was just a last week or something like that where they they would go through a process if they found a priest was uh, sexually abusing someone and they don't have to turn them over into law enforcement unless it's mandated by that country usually they would try to keep it hush hush and send them off to um you know someplace alone in a d isolated area and i couldn't believe how lax they are on handling sex abuse to children in the catholic religion church well one of the most recent cases uh they sent the priest down to South America and put him with other children and abused children down there. And so now they're trying to, you know, take it into court down there again. Uh, and the reason they sent him out of country, out of the U.S., is to, to get him out away from the court system so that he wasn't, you know, charged. Uh, there's there's a huge cover-up. And, and one of the documents that they have, there's two documents that I wanted to mention that they have uncovered at the Vatican. Okay. Uh, they, ha they have somebody at the Vatican who has gone into the sealed archives and made copies of two different um, documents. And one is called the Crimean Solicitanus. It's a document that was made back in the late 1800s. And what it does is it, it says that if uh, anybody talks bad about the church, that they are subject to excommunication. And if if they're in the Vatican, then they are subject to being put in jail for talking against the church. Really? So they use they use this to prevent uh, the Catholic authorities from revealing information to legal authorities. Then the other document that they are presenting at this court is called oh, I can't remember. I've got it in my news article. I can't remember <laughs> it right now, but it's called. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a document that was signed, I think, in 1964 by the Pope. It's on Vatican stationery that says that before a Pope is, you know, officially put into office, they go through a a ninth circle satanic ceremony where they kill a baby and drink the blood. No, really? Now, this is really a shocking and it's something that's unbelievable so it'll be really interesting to see it's, you know when this comes out during this court it's already it's already filed in the court record so they'll be bringing it out uh soon you know in in the releases they have from this international court wow and so i i'm sure you'll see copies of it on the internet well you've actually educated me a lot on it and it, you've piqued my interest to start researching it more because it's something i've never really looked into but uh, you've definitely piqued my interest to do more research on it. 
Well, if you go into my examiner articles, I've got about 10 or 12 or so specifically on this this upcoming court case. Yeah, I've pulled up and a couple as we've been talking. Of, I've been pulling up the different articles. Yeah, yeah they're, uh, it's in the examiner, and you just go into my webpage, and I'll have all the articles listed, and you can go in there. And there's a lot of research in the articles and gives you links to other places you know, to do your own research on it. Right. Or you can just research Google the web. Uh, this ninth circuit, that, uh, this ninth circle, satanic cult is is starting to come forward. And since they started to talk about it, there have been several witnesses that have been at ceremonies, not only um, in Canada, but in, uh, like I say, in France and Holland. I think there's one in the Netherlands hmm. where they hold these ceremonies, and they're regular. And they say there's some in the U.S. also. And that'll be interesting to see. I know that uh, they're probably going to do a separate investigation on this cult now that uh, some of the witnesses are starting to come forward. Wow, very interesting. Um, all right, what's what's the best place that people can uh, do to, go to to check out your book and uh, read about it and find out what the uh, ending is all about that will shock us here? I already have <laughs> childabuserecovery.com to read your articles about the ninth um, circle satanic cult murders and a lot more. So you post on there regularly? It looks like you do. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And uh, our, our, our website for our book is two two faces. The number is two two faces f a c e s dot com. And you can go in there. You can read three chapters of the book. Uh, you can buy the book from the website, or it has the other places like Amazon and Barnes and Nobles that you can buy it from. Okay. Uh, it's available in audio, uh, uh, it's uh, in paperback, of course, and then it's uh, audio. What, <laughs> what did I say? Oh, ebook. Ebook. E-book. Yes. It's, it's available as an ebook also, and you can. I go get it direct from the website or go into the other places and get it. Great. Yep. And I got those up there too. So hopefully some people we've picked their interest. Hopefully they'll go out and buy your book. And um, even more so, I hope they start re- um, researching a lot of the information that you covered, bring more attention to it. Well, one of the things that I am very interested in is that there are so many ritual abuse survivors out there which means that there are a lot of children that are undergoing ritual abuse right now, and they're in the communities. Uh, When I lived in uh, Orem here in Utah, while I was doing research for this book, I of course, people would come to me because I knew I was into this, but I counted 30 ritual abuse survivors within walking distance of my home. And, And where I am now, I know of several. Uh, when I had my first book signing, there were 10 that came to my first book signing, and there have been some that have come every time since. I've gotten acquainted with some very large organizations of survivors. One is Neil Bricks Smart. It's in Connecticut. It's it's the oldest and and largest, and he has some excellent research on his website. It's S-M-A-R-T, or Ritual Abuse R Us is another one of his website, Neil Brick. Um, he has all the latest uh, research and information on, on what's going on nationally and internationally in, in ritual abuse. There's another website called Ivory Garden. It's run um, uh, uh, by a woman that is just brilliant. And she says that there have been over 5,000 uh, survivors that have used her website over the years and she may have up to 300 active on it in any one day. Uh, these are survivors that are in there to support each other, to heal, you know, that type of a website. Oh, yeah, I see the support so we know that there these, at the bottom. Yeah, these, yeah. They're, they're, the survivor, there's all kinds of survivor organizations around. Um, so you know that there are a huge amount of people out there. Um, I... <coughs> I could talk about the LDS report if you want, or you. Sure, go ahead. Feel free. Okay. Um, <clears throat> back in the 1980s, uh, there was a book that came out uh, by the name of Michelle Remembers, and it was a story about a biography of a woman who was ritually abused as a young child. She was given over to a cult as a six-year-old by her mother. 
she grew up, and about 40 years later, she started to have these memories of all this ritual abuse that she went through. And ritual abuse, by the way, always involves the rape of a child. It always involves torture of a child and usually the murder of another child. And they do this to mind control these children into multiple personalities. So as she grew up, she started having these memories. So she went to a psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Lawrence Pazder. The two of them wrote to Michelle Remembers, and it came out in 1980. It became a bestseller. And right after it became a bestseller, there were literally thousands of people that started to go to therapists saying, this happened to me. So by 1993, there was an organization uh, form called the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Disassociation, ISSTD. And there's another organization like it form, but this is, these are organizations of professionals who wanted to get together and, and form modalities for treatment for these survivors of, of abuse. And the reason they got together it was because the uh, American Psychiatric Association uh, was not doing it. And that has to do with the mind control program that they were in, that the APA was involved in and could still be involved in uh, through the U.S. government and the Canadian government in the mind control program. But anyway, since they did, couldn't get the modalities from the APA, they formed their own ISSTD. Those therapists in that organization that treat ritual abuse survivors number over seven or nine hundred right now globally. So you know that there's a huge problem out there about it. So that was going on in 1983 and then these there were also a lot of ritual abuse survivors that were going to uh, I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints LDS and it's here in Utah, you know, centered here in Utah. Well, they have an arm, there's 15 million members worldwide, but they have a counseling arm called LDS Social Services. So there were a lot of survivors who were going to LDS Social Services uh, saying that they had been ritually abused. A president of the church at the time was Ezra Taft Benson. Uh, Ezra Taft Benson used to be uh, Secretary of Agriculture under Dwight D. Eisenhower. But he was president of the church at the time, and at the same time that all he was getting all these reports from LDS social services, and he grew up in Idaho, and uh, up by where his hometown was, there was a little baby found in a trash can that had the organs missing, and it obviously had been ritually abused. Right. It's called the Baby X uh, case up in Idaho. They did never find the perpetrators. They did find a witness to it, but that was many years later, and of course they couldn't take it through court. But they did form the first legislation specific to ritual abuse. It's called the Baby X Law in Idaho. So all this uh, publicity was going on about ritual abuse, and so President Benson decided to form a committee, and it was a 12-person committee, and... Uh, they went out and interviewed over a hundred people or so that said that they were being ritually abused. And uh, he, a man by the name of uh, Glenn Pace, who was a uh, presiding authority, uh, he was in the bishop brick of the for the church. He was put over that committee. Um, a rep uh, one of the a report that he made to um, the president, uh, President Benson. Um, was released by some people on the internet. Uh, you know, it was anyway. It got released on the internet without you know Elder Pace's knowledge. And when that happened, there were literally hundreds of reporters calling his office because one of the things it says in the report is that 45 members witnessed human sacrifice. And so there are all these reporters calling the church asking, you know, for interviews, and, and they refused to give any interviews on the report. Huh. When I was doing my book, um, I had it up at a very large publishing house in New York, and my literary agent, who was a New York literary agent, said, you've got to get an interview on this report in order to put information. That's another thing that's in my book, 22 Faces, is information about this report. 
Um, he says, you've got to get an interview in order to put this in the book. And so I contacted uh, the First Presidency, and a couple of weeks later, Elder Pace called me, and he gave me the only interview he has ever given on that report. Wow. What he told me is that we had they had so many people that they needed to interview that they only interviewed. He says, we could have... He says, we ended up interviewing over 100 people, but we could have interviewed three times that many if we had the time. What they did is they, they interviewed all these people, and then they hired a genealogist to trace the, uh, the lineage of these uh, survivors because, like I say, this is handed down in multi-generational satanic families, you know, from father, usually the father you know, to the children. And so they were trying to trace and find out who the perpetrators were. So they, they defined what perpetrators they could, and they excommunicated them from the church. Hmm. And then they handed over the information to uh, the Utah Attorney General, because a lot of the you know, uh, victims were here in Utah. At the same time that they were doing their report, uh, the uh, Utah Attorney General had become alarmed at all these, you know, uh, victims that were coming forth and saying that they were being ritually abused as children. So they had formed their own committee, and it was had, one of the co-chair was Noemi Mattis, who's a very prominent uh, therapist. She has a PhD in her JD here in Utah. And she was head of that committee, and they went out and they interviewed all of the uh, counselors and investigators in the state that were dealing with ritual abuse cases. They came up with some of the same information that was in the LDS report. So they handed all that information over to the Utah State Legislature, and they hired uh, ritual abuse investigators at the state under the Utah AG office. Their first arrest when these people got hired was the man whose father was of these women that came to me and the reason they came to me was because he was under arrest and they had only charged him with abuse of one of the girls in the family and there were several more that had been abused by him. And they wanted to get more uh, information to the Utah AG office because as children, now these were 20, they were both, they were cousins and they were 24 years old, they were married, they had children of their own, but they had come across each other uh, by accident and found out that they were having some of these same repressed memories come back that corresponded with each other. And they had could remember uh, murders, they could remember being raped by their fathers, and they remembered the places where they were and things like that. So I and them went out to different places where they could remember you know, these things happening to them. And that's the information that we were gathering and taking up to the Utah AG office. And I had interviews up there with the ritual abuse investigators. I had it with uh, Lieutenant Attorney General Reed Richards. And we were feeding them all this information. They, for whatever reasons, did not choose to go any further with the investigation. And this man got off on a quirk of the law. Amazing. And it was for that it was for that reason that I was taking this information to an FBI agent to try to get a case open on this, and he's a satanic cult leader. He is, uh, through the um, conversations I had with the Utah AG office, they are investigating eight satanic covens here in Utah. And he is kind of the ringleader, and he takes information between here and, and uh, Arizona and uh, Nevada and California over to Jenny Hill's Garden Grove uh, area where she was ritually abused, by the way. Um, so this man is still out there, and he's still doing his thing along with his different Coven stuff. Yeah. So at that point, I started to report uh, information to the Utah AG office as I came across it from different survivors. Finally, in 2006, um, I got a call from the head of investigations at the Utah AG office, Charles Hostler, and he asked me to bring my information into his office. So my husband and I went up to his office and we handed him a three-ring binder of all of the uh, investigations that I had done over the years with these ritual abuse uh, victims. 
what he told me was that they have uh, they looked into it a look you know somewhat during this uh, investigation period when they hired these ritual abuse investigators who by the way uh, the the head investigator was Mike King and he was hired by Homeland Security when they formed that and he went over there and did the ritual abuse training at Homeland Security but and he says we kind of dropped the ball since then he says we want to pick up on it again he just he had just uh, been over the arrest of Warren Jeffs, the polygamous leader. He says, we've got Warren Jeffs in jail now, so we're going to uh, go back to the ritual abuse stuff. So that's why he called me into his office. Huh. And then we set up a communication system. He says, don't call me, uh, don't email me. He said, we don't know who all is in this. He says, so we set up a communication system that I have with them where I give them information when I come across it from survivors. Wow. Uh, so they're aware, you know, that this is going on. They're aware that there are people in the government uh, that are involved in it and that try to cover it up. And there are actually special investigation teams in different states uh, that work on this, but they have to work kind of away from the normal uh, way that they do things because they know that there are other people that they actually work with that could be involved in these satanic stuff. Uh, and that's one of the ways they cover it up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they, they cover it up good, huh? <laughs> well, they sure do. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is really, really a big deal that this uh, information about this Ninth Circle has come out. Because they're really the you know head honchos up there. Well, I'm, I'm going to definitely research it more and put out some stuff on my educate site that I have. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. I'm surprised I've never really heard of it. So, uh, let's go ahead and plug your book one more time. It's 22faces.com. It's 22 faces inside the extraordinary life of Jenny Hill and her 22 multiple personalities by Judy Byington, Tate Publishing. Uh, the website is 22faces.com, 22faces.com. All right. There you have it. Well, it was great talking to you. You've really educated me. Hopefully, you've uh, alerted more people to the issue that's out there with the satanic um, child rituals. And best of luck with uh, – are you going to write a new book, or is, are you stopping after this one, or are you going forward with a new book? Oh, I'm, I've got another book coming out. But before I talk about that, I wanted to say one sure, thing. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah. Our, our real purpose is to find these little children that are undergoing ritual abuse right now. Now, there are two things that these children will exhibit. One is that they will have voices in their heads. And the other part that they will exhibit is this disassociation. Like, it's not just not being able to remember things. It's not, it's be, not being able to remember whole segments of time like the last day or the last month or the last hour where their alters are taking over. When a child starts acting like that, and they're usually very shy, uh, very timid, they have been you know, threatened with their lives, they're very fearful children, they're not very social. When you find a child with those kinds of things, you need to report it. You need to try to do something about it because they are likely being abused in their home by a close relative. And those are the children we're trying to get out. And another way we're trying to work with this is that we have a petition out. And again, you can go into childabuserecovery.com uh -huh. and click on the petition and sign it. And we encourage you to do that because this is a petition for another investigation of the CIA mind control program. We are convinced. Uh, in fact, I'll have some articles come out in the near future uh, of, of victims who are being accessed right now. Uh, child victims that are being accessed by this mind control program of the CIA where they are torturing children into multiple personalities. And we're trying to get a petition uh, to Congress. We've, we've been working with some senators, but we need thousands more signatures on this petition in order to get Congress to take a look at this CIA mind control program. We're trying to save some children, and I really encourage people to go in there and do that. All right, and I'll share, I'll uh, share that change.org page for you, too. Okay. And, what, well, I, I forgot what you were going to oh, ask your, me to do. Your next book. Do you want to okay. plug that? Oh, my next book. Okay. Uh, my next book is called uh, Reflections, 
and it's uh, the it's the out of body experiences of uh, severe abuse survivors. And we hope to have that out soon. And then I've got another book that will be coming out. Uh, it'll probably be a while before that one gets out, but it's called Saints, Sinners, and Satan. And it's my story of, of uh, some of the information I've just given you about what, uh, my contact with ritual abuse survivors and, and the different legal entities and what's going on here, uh, both nationally and internationally, with child kidnapping and exploitation rings. All right. Well, thanks a lot for this interview, and um, continue to keep up the good fight. You're doing a lot of good out there with your uh, program and your book, and, and keep it up for us. Okay, Judy. Well, I thank you for thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. It's, it's you're doing great work yourself. I appreciate uh, the advertisement for this. No problem. It's a good cause. Good thing to get out there. All right, Judy. Have a great day. You too. Thank All you. Right, bye. Bye. All right. So there we have it. That was Judy. Um, I I don't have the split screen right now. Where am I at? Um, go out there, check out our book, 22 Faces, and, um, you know, get involved. We'll research a little bit more. May, some of you may not um, buy into it. Go out there and see what's happening. See, read up about the conviction um, and the international court and all that good stuff. I'm going to share some of the information on my Educate page, and hopefully this uh, educates you, makes you more aware, it inspires you to get out there and look for things and make some change. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great day.